as always. So welcome everyone to our next lecture on probabilistic reasoning and machine learning. Today we talk about model selection. Yeah, that is an, a topic where one rarely speaks about. Sometimes I always assume that everyone knows about it, what to do. But of course, the students don't, right, if they just learn this topic. So I included a full lecture on model selection, which is an interesting topic because it's a bit meta. Yeah, it's a bit meta learning somehow. So we look at two approaches. One approach is we evaluate on test error, like on some other data set, and ideally the slides are working. And we explain what cross-validation is. So those are like typical ways to do model selection. And I will explain what model selection is in a second. And then, of course, we also look at the Bayesian version of it. Yeah? And um, on these slides, I put a lot of formulas, but I put them there for completeness. So there's a pattern behind. And typically, when you look at a textbook, they don't put all the variations on a slide. But I have all the variations on a slide for Bayesian model selection, for example, for the hyper prior and the hyper hyper posterior. And I wrote down all the formulas. And I think it's useful to do. It's a good exercise also for me to do it. And that's something that's sometimes missing in textbook uh, explanations. So ideally, after listening to this lecture, you will be also um, able to understand the model selection chapter in other textbooks or maybe in a blog or on a paper or something. So let's first go to part one. So this is more like a classical non-Bayesian way of doing model selection, OK? So here's the setup. Yeah, let's talk about linear regression. We have a data set given. Yeah, very practical. This is your data set from your company where you work or something. So it's input-output pairs. And typically, the output, they are noisy. There might be some, um, some, some noise on top of them. We define a model. Yeah, so for this, last time, we defined, for example, some basis functions which were like these monomials. Now, this is all scalar-valued, so the monomials are just the, the, the scalars to the power of something. And now, don't be confused. Again, the x is typically a vector, but now it's just a scalar. Yeah? So often, I use the convention from last lecture, matrix differential calculus, but sometimes not. So always be careful what, whether we are talking about vectors or scalars. And with these basis functions now, I can model the relationship between input and output by such a function f, which is just the inner product of my feature vector from my basis function and some w, some parameter. Okay? And now here we are more careful what is the parameter. So we have the parameter w, which is a vector of the appropriate size, and we have a hyperparameter d. Okay? And this means now all three variables are bounded somewhere on this slide, right? So there's nothing floating around. Before I didn't have this end hyperparameter d, there the d in this w was, already, was still a free variable only bounded by this expression over here. But that's why I also included the d into the function. So the d is another parameter of my function, okay? And if I choose a different d, I have a different function. Later we will see when I do the implementation in Python, Somehow the d can be abstracted just by calling size of w, right? So it's just the size of w. So by choosing a particular w, I'm also choosing the d. But let's write the parameter d explicitly down here, OK? That's why I'm also explicitly writing it down on the basis function. So now what are we doing? We are defining some loss function, OK? We take the mean squared error, yeah, which is just the the, the, the difference, the square difference between the, um, the true value yeah, and the calculated value from my function. Yeah? And note now I'm having all these additional parameters here. Often we use shortcut f of x, but there is a w and there is a d. And so in this lecture, it's about w and d. So we need to be really careful about it. Um, and um, this could be plugged in. So then we just have the expression over there on the back, which is now using the function that I plugged in here. But basically, the form of the f doesn't matter really for today. However, I also explicitly wrote down the mean squared error now, not just saying it's the MSE, but it's the MSE for a particular data set, for a particular w, and for a particular parameter d. Okay? Because later on, we will have expressions where there will be several MSE expressions with different d's. Okay? Training data, test data, for the people who know already what I'm up to. So 
Now, what we learned last time, or the last time before last time, in the linear regression lecture was that we minimize the mean squared error, yeah, and that is the maximum likelihood estimator under some certain Gaussian assumptions. Yeah, and it could be written now also as a function, the WML, that takes as parameter the data set and the hyperparameter, okay? And it's just the argument of applying the MSE. And again, here everything is nicely bounded, so there are no free floating variables which are implicit or so. Now the big question is, what is the best choice for D? And that is model selection, okay? So D equals one, fitting a linear function, that's one possible model for my data. Yeah, D equals two, fitting a parabola to my data, it's another model, okay? And how can I select between these models? Also, it's curious, the parameter W is something, it's living in a continuous space, right? It's in the R to the D plus one. So it's a continuous parameter, so I can somehow, uh, I can do gradient descent and these kind of things, for example. Uh, my parameter D is slightly different here now, it's a discrete parameter. So I really have to compare some discrete amount of models against each other, and I want to pick the best one. However, sometimes also the hyperparameter, think of the parameters of a beta prior, for example. They could be also continuous, okay, and you can do gradient descent on it, as we will at the very end of the lecture. Hopefully we get so far. No, I think we get to the end. Okay, so model selection is a question. I have different models. I have one for d equals one, d equals two, d equals three, yeah? And then which one is the best? It doesn't have to be always like that. The model could be also, I have a support vector machine, I have a neural network, I have a decision tree. Those are also three models which might solve some classification task. And model selection could also mean which of these three is the best, okay? So that's also model selection. Sometimes we would call these hypothesis one, it's linear regression. Hypothesis two, it's a neural network. Hypothesis three, it's a support vector machine. I think I changed the ordering now. But um, that's a different level of model selection, yeah? If you would like to think of that. Okay, model selection, that is a problem. Here comes our first attempt. And the first attempt is like the most obvious thing and it will be very bad, okay? So let's look at our first idea. So why not take our estimate, right? Given the data, given the current D, and we minimize the mean squared error, yeah? over the D now. So we take the D, which is giving us the overall mean squared error of the data. Okay, that's our first choice, D1. So I can plug in the expression for the W, ML, okay, which is also an argument. So you see there are two arguments inside. One argument for the W and one for the D. One for the parameter and one for the hyperparameter, okay? And Probably you could also do it simultaneously and you just have one argument of the pair of W and D. Um, however, as it turns out, that is not a good idea. This will overfit your data, right? So the overall mean squared error, of course, is minimized if the D is going really large, yeah? And I can show you, um, should I show you already code? Yeah, let's show already code. So I have a linear uh, regression um, implementation for the model um, selection task here. So this is all the same code as before, where here I omit the D because I can get it from the shape of W, okay, so I don't need it. Then I can sample my data from my model over here. I have the, the linear regression formula, that is the estimator for my W, so far so good. And now I have another function, the mean squared error, which is taking as a, a list of x and a list of y, and then calculating the overall mean squared error of it, okay? So let's generate some data. So this is now some, uh, some this is my true w, for example, and I can sample some training data. For plotting, I'm having some locations on the x-axis, which is just the Linz space, so this is my prediction x. And then I can repeat the um, linear regression function for different Ds, okay? And that's a plot that you've seen already. So you see maybe at the beginning, I'm having the training data which is sampled from some true function and I can try for um, D equals two, D equals, okay, D equals two is a bit confusing. That's because of the one in my basis function, right? There's a constant one and then the X. That's why D equals two is a linear function. So D equals three is the parabola and so on and so forth. And 
it works nicely until the D gets too large. What happens when the D gets too large? It's really going more trying to go through the points. So it's really very flexible suddenly. We can also calculate this numerically. So let's calculate the mean squared error yeah, for different Ws for varying D. So let's increase the 1 to 16. Uh, so let's uh, D range from 1 to 16 and calculate the mean squared error numerically. And as you see, the error goes down and down and down and down. So the largest D is the best, right? And as you can see here, yeah, such a large D is clearly overfitting. Okay? Even worse here, so let's include the 16, for example. So I think it gets really bad. Yeah, now this looks like, oh, I did some plotting wrongly, but it's just if you have x to the 16, and actually it's x to the 17, d plus 1, yeah, then basically just off the data, yeah, my, my term with x to the 17 is dominating everything and is just going to infinity. Yeah, it's just going off scale very quickly. So I would have to zoom in here. I have no idea how to zoom in. Uh, whatever, I don't try it. So you see that this just evaluating my mean squared error now on the same data that I used to estimate my w is not a good idea. So I'm really overfitting here. So let's do something more clever. Let's try to minimize some test error. So this is a so-called training error over here. But let's try to minimize a test error for the d on unseen data. Um, however, we don't have unseen data. We only have this single data set. That was the Excel sheet that we got. How can we do it? We split it into two parts, into a training part and into a test part. Okay? And we train only on the training, and then we do the model selection on the test part. Okay? So let's do that. And now you see why the notation is handy. So we split the data set in disjoint parts, ideally randomly. So don't take the first 100 rows of your Excel sheet for training and the last 100 rows for testing. There might be changing distributions, possibly there's a certain ordering. So better mix it up. Do it randomly. And then we train on the training set and we evaluate on the so-called evaluation set. And now train and evaluate are arbitrary words. What we're doing is we are fitting a parameter and we are fitting a hyperparameter. Okay, so here in this context, training is fitting a parameter, evaluation is fitting a hyperparameter. And of course, you could imagine fitting a hyper hyperparameter and fitting a hyper 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 hyperparameter, right? But here we only have train and evaluate, so this is not scaling well, this wording here, okay? Okay, in step two, how are we doing it now? So we are again minimizing the mean squared error in terms of the D, but now. Um, we evaluate the mean squared error on data that hasn't been used to estimate our w. And now you see why this notation, it might look a bit cumbersome, and I, haven't, I, haven't, I, I don't have it from textbooks, so people in textbook don't use it, but they talk about it with many words. But I think the formula makes it really clear how you use the different data sets. Okay? So the inner part here, the estimation of the parameter is using the training data, and the outer thing for the hyperparameter is using the evaluation data. Yeah? So far, so good. That works quite well. Yeah, that's not bad. Then now we are not overfitting. So let's look at it. So this is the second attempt now. And here I, again, sample new data, completely new data. Yeah? I don't split. I have the luxury of just calling sample w, and then I get new data that hasn't been used for the estimation. And then I'm, um, again, I'm choosing the training data that I defined above to find the w for varying d's, okay? And then I'm evaluating now my evaluation set. And if I'm doing this, now we can see it's going down up to d equals 3, and then it's increasing again, which is nice, right? So by this now we have an automatic way to choose the right parameter, okay? And that's it already. That's the basic idea of model selection. Split your data into two. What comes now are just variations of the same idea. Of course, we can have another level. We can have a hyper-hyper step by splitting the data set in three parts, typically called training, validation, test data set. And that will be on the next slide. Um, because, why are we doing it? Because now let's say, let's calculate now the test error for the best D. Okay, let's do that. And in this case now, let's use even more data, yeah? So now we have W true. Uh, now this should be W test. No, 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 this is right. So we are generating X test and Y test. So we have even more data. And if we do that and evaluate it, we see, 
okay, it's now 5%. So here we were a little bit optimistic on that one, right? So we are, were also overfitting with our model parameter. So it means the model parameter was nicely chosen, but the actual mean squared error, it's like a bit too optimistic. So that's not what we would expect on unseen data. That is what we expect on the data set that we had, okay? So you see the third attempt will be we need to have even additional data to calculate the true test error, okay? So far so good. The effect here is very similar to the question, um, let's say you're you're having some, some whatever, heights or, yeah, let's say heights of people and you want to estimate the variance, okay? But you don't have the mean. Then you first estimate the mean and then you take the mean to calculate the variance. By that you are kind of, um, optimizing a little bit too much, yeah? It's like saying, um, so here's the 2D example. Let's say I want to calculate the variance of this data set, yeah? How do I do it? I calculate the mean, so this is the mean here, and then I'm calculating the square distances to that one. However, is this really the true mean? Probably not, right? The true mean is somewhere close by, but it, it's very unlikely that it's the exact right location. However, this estimate, the mean, the empirical mean has the property that it minimizes the square distances to all the other points. So it's like definitely the one that is minimizing the variance. However, the true mean might have a slightly larger variance. So also here the variance is a little bit over-optimistic. By the way, that's the reason why you say 1 divided by n minus 1 in the variance estimator, right? Have you seen the 1 over n minus 1? So it has something to do with biasness and unbiasedness, okay? However, you see, I leave it a little hand wavy because I'm not an expert on these topics, right? But this is just the intuition. Great. So I discussed already the problem. So now the question is, we have a parameter, great. We have a hyperparameter, even nicer. How can we evaluate it? Now you should report to your boss and she wants to know, so how good is it? So what's the error on data that comes tomorrow? And for that you need additional data. So you want to estimate the test error on never ever seen data. And um, of course, oh, that's what I, just what I said. You cannot just use this value, the MSE on the evaluation set. That's a bit too optimistic, okay? So that is underestimating the true error. So what we're doing, we just split it into three parts. And now we train on the training set, we evaluate on the evaluation set, and then we test on the test set. Uh, translated, we are fitting the parameter W on the training set, we are fitting the hyperparameter W on the evaluation set, and we are fitting, no, we are calculating the mean squared error then on the uh, test data, okay? Um, so we choose, uh, what is this, choose D? Oh uh, yeah, oh, this is not the latest version of the slides. How come? I oh, know it is, okay, it is, it's, it's fine. Um, so the thing is, my parameter D is chosen by minimizing the mean squared error on the evaluation set, my parameter W is chosen by minimizing the mean squared error on the training set. And I didn't plug in the integral here, so, or the argument in here. I could have plugged in the argument here to make it more clear, like I did on the previous version over there where you see that it's like in inside itself. So maybe I should add that here at this point too. Anyway, now finally I'm calculating the mean squared error on even unseen data that haven't been used on the test data, and there you see now, I can now plug in my D3, which is the argument from the second step, I plug it into the mean squared error over here, but I use new data that haven't been done before, that haven't been used before, okay? And this is the gold standard, how to do things, right? There's no overfitting now on the parameter, and I don't have an over, overly um, optimistic estimate of my mean squared error, so another form of overfitting, for the hyperparameter, okay? Um, however, there's some more thoughts on this one. Um, there are some problems. We are not using all the data, right? So we are only using part of the data for the parameter. Now the big question is, 
how to split it, right? That's a very often asked question, and I, I don't have answers to that one typically. So I, I don't know. So it depends on many, many parameters. How well you can estimate the W. If your data is super noisy, maybe it's very important that the um, training data set is large enough so that you have a, a kind of good estimate for the W, right? If the data is not so noisy, you can maybe spend some more of the energy on the hyperparameter, OK? And so on and so forth. However, there are also some hacks. And one hack is called cross-validation. So cross-validation is now trying to find a compromise. So you want to use all data for estimating the parameters and for estimating the hyperparameters, but you don't want to um, uh, make these mistakes that I explained in attempt one and attempt two. And that's what cross-validation is about, OK? Um, so here's cross-validation. But let's talk first about a simple setup without a hyperparameter, OK? So let's first talk about the simples form, where I'm only trying to fit a parameter, OK? And at the end, um, I want to evaluate the test error. So I'm omitting this stuff with the hyperparameter. Um, so we have data, and we have a model with parameter w, and the parameter w is not known. We don't know it, OK? So it's not coming from a colleague next door. However, there's no hyperparameter, so I was right with that, that one. Our goal is now to estimate the parameter and to estimate the test error, OK? We want to have both in a way. But actually, we are after estimating the test error. That's the essential thing that we want to know. Right, So the, we are not interested really in the point estimate of the W, but we want to see how good is the mo model overall. So now we do this by splitting our, our data set into two parts, where one part we use for estimating our parameter W, and the second part is used to estimate the mean squared error. And our cross-validation means that now we have a second round where we swap the worlds. Now we estimate W on the second part of my data, and then we estimate the mean squared error on the first part of the data. OK? And then finally, we are averaging. And of course, now um, you can easily generalize it to k fold cross validation. OK? Let's do that on the next slide. So there you split your data set into k disjoint subsets yeah, of approximately equal size. It's a good idea. And now we iterate over k. So the subset, one of them, of these, is playing the role of the test set. So one is left out for later on to estimate the mean squared error. The others are joined, and we estimate our parameter w on it. OK? So we always leave part of our data set aside and estimate the parameter on the rest. And then we calculate the mean squared error on the left out part. However, as you see, this is a for loop. So we do these k times. So instead of running your neural net or whatever and training it for one month once, you have to do it k times. So it's really expensive. So it requires a lot of computation. Maybe you have a cluster with k GPUs, and then you're fine. You can run it in parallel. Um, finally, then the cross-validation estimate of my test error then is just the average that I get from these epsilon i's. Okay? And there's one special case that, that got an, a special name, is k is equal to n, where n is the number of data points. Then this is also called leave one out cross validation. Okay? So this sounds really, just a second, this is really extreme. You just leave out one point, you train on all the rest, and then you just evaluate on a single point from your um, data set. But you do it for all data points. And that's sometimes an even better estimate. Question? No, I train on the union, of, the union of, all. of d1 to dk minus 1, and I leave out the dk. So this is really set minus. So this is really take all data and remove the one in di. But you have to you train on k minus 1 sets simultaneously. But you have to repeat this k times, because each of these sets will play the role of the test set once. So the big advantage now here is that this training procedures will look at all the data for estimating w. It will also look at all the data for estimating the mean squared error, which is good because sometimes there might be an outlier, and this outlier might create a very large mean squared error, which will spoil your estimate, but only if it's in the test set. 
if it's in the training set, maybe your training algorithm is robust against outliers, and you don't have to worry about it. Okay? So this is nice that every data point has been used for estimating the test error and used for um, calculating the parameters. Now, why did I remove the hyperparameters? Because you can imagine, now this must be nested. So you must do a k-fold cross-validation of a k-fold cross-validation. Because, of course, also for the inside, you can apply cross-validation um, not only to estimate the mean squared error, but of course we can also use it to do the model selection step to find the D, right? And then we will have an inner k-fold cross-validation where we estimate the W and estimate the D and do this k times. And then there's an outer k-fold cross-validation yeah, where you split it from the outside and remove one of the steps, and you also have to remove, uh, reduce this k times. So in total, if you have a parameter, a hyperparameter, and you want to estimate the mean squared error with k for trust validation, in that case, typically you have to run it k squared times, which is super expensive. However, this is the k-fold trust validation gold standard if you do it nestedly. So here I've written it down for you. So now let's have the same data set. We have a model with parameter w and a hyperparameter. And again, our goal is to estimate the test error. In the outer loop, I'm splitting my data set into d1 to dk. Yeah, I want to do cross-validation. And I have the same loop as on the previous slide. Um, OK, this is the usual k-fold cross-validation that we've just seen. The only thing that changed is the inner step here where I'm now saying train W and D on this reduced data set. That's the only change. You see, cross-validation is confusing with parameters and hyperparameters. Please look at the textbooks, whether they do a better job in explaining it. Yeah? It is always a bit confusing. So and now comes the inner loop. So there's an inner K prime fold cross-validation to estimate basically the MSE for the hyperparameter choice. OK? If I would have spelled it out, I next would have to split D without DI into K prime parts and leave one out of these, OK? Which is really ugly to write down. Yeah? So I think this is a good way to write down, but it looks like it's confusing me during the lecture. OK? Maybe I should keep the parts in, in the lecture. OK. So this is the nested cross validation, and that is another gold standard to estimate basically the mean squared error. Yeah? That's making use of all the data. The previous gold standard that I showed you is good if you have large amounts of data and it's very easy to generate more and more and more and more. But if you have a finite Excel sheet with your data, then you should use cross-validation okay, to make use of all the data. So far, so good. Any questions up to here? OK, great. Then let's put our Bayesian hat on now, OK? And let's do Bayesian model selection. And Bayesian model selection is now something slightly different. So in Bayesian model selection, we are always using all the data and can achieve the same thing under the assumption that we can calculate arbitrarily complicated integrals, OK? And that's where the Bayesian model selection will fail on us, so where we where we will see that we can't do it in practice. However, theoretically, it's a really nice framework. And if you can calculate all the expressions that I will show you, that is, I think, an even better way to do it. However, in practice, it's not doable. OK, so here's Bayesian inference as a reminder. So typically, we have some parameter w, and we need now to specify prior. That's the Bayesian thing about Bayesian inference, that we have prior assumptions. We have a likelihood. That's very classic, so it tells us how is our data generated according to our model. And then we do inference given our data just by doing Bayes rule, right? We just write down Bayes rule to get a posterior distribution. And this is giving us now um, a distribution over the parameter, okay? So maybe we say the W is Gaussian distributed with very wide variance around zero, then after seeing the data, our posterior distribution is a Gaussian distribution around 5, and the variance shrinked somewhat, some got smaller. Okay, So that's Bayesian inference. 
Now, what is this part down here? That is the so-called evidence, and that is now integrating out our w, okay? And curiously, this also has an interpretation, and it tells us how likely is it that we see our data under the given model, but without concretely estimating a w. So we are avoiding a point estimate for the w. Instead, we are integrating it out, okay? So we have the probability of seeing the data given a particular w, and we have a certain prior on our parameters, and that enables us to calculate, assuming a certain model, yeah, a certain prior and a certain likelihood, like a linear model or whatever you name it, we can calculate how likely is it to see that data. Um, why is that such a big deal? Because um, let's say um, we have some data set um, which Yeah, some, some noisy parabola, okay? And then there's um, different models that I can try. Okay, here's my first model. My first model might be the constant function, okay? And then I can, the constant function has one parameter. Where do I put it, okay? And it's basically probably the mean of my, um, so this is x1, or this is x and this is y. So the height is probably the mean of the y values or something, and you can ignore the x, right? Because the constant function doesn't look at the x anyway. So it will be something like the mean. However, I'm not really interested in the mean. I'm interested in having some prior distribution over the possible parameters, which in this case is the height. How likely is it that this is some data generated from this model, okay? And you will see the fit is not so nice, right? So you have here really large errors. And as it turns out, you will integrate over all these errors and you get some large number. Okay, second choice, some linear function, which now has some height, some part here, and some slope. And there the errors already get smaller. So, so let's say this thing has a p of d, so let's call it for d equal to 1 some number, okay, and I can also calculate for that one some evidence. So d equals 2, yeah, some linear function. And typically, the probability here will be higher than that one, right? Because the mean squared errors are smaller and Gaussian distribution e to the minus, mean squared error, blah, blah, blah. Next model, I'm having a, a, some, some parabola thing, and for that one, again, I can calculate some evidence. And again, I'm not really interested in the particular parameters. I'm only interested in integrating out over, the, um, over my prior. Yeah? So that is the evidence. The evidence gives me different possibilities. Um, now, if you look at this, so for example, the, the constant function has not so many possibilities. The linear function has more possibilities, right? The squared function has even more possibilities because my w now has length 3. Now for d being equal to 16 or something, yeah, I might get some function like this, which is fitting the data even nicer. Now the question is whether the p of d for d equals 16 or something, whether it's even better than the one for over here. However, as it turns out, comparing these will allow me to choose the right d. Okay? And the Hand wavy reason is, so it's a hand wavy reason because I'm, I'm making it up now, I, but I have some, some picture in mind which I now try to draw for you that I got from some textbooks. <coughs> so those are the possible data sets that I can fit, Re right? So that is a very weird axis. So every point here corresponds to one possible data set that I might observe, okay? Now, the constant function can explain some, maybe only these ones. Those are like, they are very, very well explained by my constant functions. So the P of D will be very large for exactly those, and it will be very bad for all the others, okay? Now, what about the linear functions? 
the linear functions, they are a bit more flexible. So maybe they explain data sets from this area. So they explain the data sets from the constant function, but also a few more. So now I have to put the p of d, like uh, this one, and plot it. However, it will then look like this. So it will be not so high as the other one, but lower because the, the area under this curve must be equal to 1. However, I distribute it over more possible data sets. Let's go on. Let's take the one with the 16. The 16 one is quite good, yeah? but um, or that might be the 3 one. Or let's say this is the one for d equals 1, d equals 2, d equals 3. Let's take the 16 one. So the 16 one is fitting very well to many, 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 many data sets. Yeah? It is super flexible to go through all these data sets. So it's distributing its weight very far. However, that makes it very low. Now, suppose I'm having this data set here, which is sampled from a squared function. It will turn out it is somewhere here. And the evidence for d equals 3 is the one that is dominating over here. So those are too simple. They don't explain it very well because they are too simple. This one is kind of overfitting to it, right? Even though it explains it, it's itself it is spreading it so much across everything, right? So that the weight that it can give to this data set is not very high. Okay, that is a confusing picture, but I think you might see it also in the textbooks. Yeah. So it says that in uh, this Bayesian model selection, I can just look at the evidence for my different models, and the more flexible models. They can explain many more data sets, and for that reason, the evidence for each of these data sets is smaller. And the more specific functions, like a parabola or a linear function, they are more special, specialized. They put all their weights on a smaller set, and by this, for those, they are larger. Okay? That's why the evidence is something useful, so we can use it for model comparison. Okay? So, okay, this is just all you know already. So the posterior is blah, blah, blah. It's like prior times likelihood and normalized by the evidence. And the posterior tells us what parameter yeah, might be the right one after we've seen the data, but it's a distribution over parameters. However, the evidence, this thing here, it will integrate out the parameter via the sum rule, and it's the so-called expected likelihood under the prior. Yeah, so... It is really an expectation. It's the expected value of the likelihood yeah, where I integrate my random variable w with my prior. OK? Let's now get more complicated. So that is the simple case. Let's add a an hyperparameter here. And let's write out the same expressions that we just seen, but now with the hyperprior. So the prior was now something, whatever, our parameter w is coming from a Gaussian distribution. However, what about the parameters of the Gaussian distributions, right? So there's a mean and a variance. And that could be also modeled as a random variable, and let's call them theta, OK? And since we are Bayesian about it, we should have a prior for these parameters. So those thetas are now hyperparameters, and they get their hyperprior, OK? So this is level 1, and this is level 2. Another example is the data are coin flips. My parameter is the bias of my coin, OK? So this parameter of the Bernoulli distribution, yeah, the probability of seeing heads. And I'm having a prior on my parameter, which could be a uniform prior. That is a beta 1, 1 distribution. But maybe I want to be even more Bayesian in saying, oh, the 1, 1 in my prior, I'm also not so sure about it. Let's say it's also a random variable. Let's say I have two parameters, A and B. And for A and B, I could have a hyper prior. And there's an appropriate conjugate prior that works nicely with the beta distribution together. And so the theta would be the A and B. Where does it end? It ends once you write down a prior, a hyper, 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 hyper prior that doesn't have any parameters anymore, that just has numbers in there. And typically, when you implement something like that, you will see the point where you just have numbers, right? When you write down things 
as a mathematician on a sheet of papers, you often write letters and more letters, and you say, yeah, yeah, that's a number or something. However, here it's really important. So what values are really varying and could change, and what values are really constant, okay? And that's where the hierarchy ends. Okay, level one, inference of the parameters. So that's exactly the same expressions as before, but now everything is conditioned on the theta, okay? So it's the same formulas, but now conditioned on my parameter theta. And if you look very precisely, you see, huh, but what about the likelihood? There's no theta. I already missed it over here. Why is there no theta? And I can show you by writing down a nice graphical model. So here's the graphical model. This is my data. And the data can be also seen like a random variable, sure. And it is conditioned on the parameter. And the parameter is conditioned on my hyperparameter theta, which means the data and the theta are independent conditioned on the w. So once I know the true value for this one, yeah, the data doesn't tell me anything about the theta. OK? So you see they are deseparated in this graph. It's a trivial graph. But it explains why you can omit the theta in this expression over here. Okay? So you can omit it because the data and the hyperparameter are independent given the parameter. That's a nice sentence. Maybe I should put that one into the slide. Level two, let's do the same thing. So let's now say, okay, I have a hyper prior. What is my hyper likelihood? My hyper likelihood is the evidence. OK, it's P of the data given the theta. And that looks very much like on the previous slide, we had a P of D given the W. OK, so also the hyper prior could play the role of a parameter from the perspective of the data. However, the expression is an integral. Yeah? So this is an integral here, which could be really difficult to evaluate in closed form. But on pieces of papers, I can write it down like this. Um, Similarly, now I can apply Bayes' rule and I get a hyper posterior. So that is after seeing the data, what is my updated beliefs about the hyperparameters? And I don't care for the W in these expressions. Similarly, this is the hyper evidence. And now you see where this goes. Of course, you can have a third level as well, and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth level. It doesn't matter. And I will show you practically where you stop. Uh, I tell you where you stop already now. You stop. I think already at this evidence here. That's where you typically stop. But in principle, for conceptually, yeah, you can go on and on and on. And if you come up with a nice programming language, which like PyTorch is doing automatic differentiation, if you come up with a nice toolbox for Python or with a programming language that can do automatic integration, then we are in business and you can do Bayesian model selection just as the equations on the pieces of paper. However, there's a big difference between differentiation and integration. I thought about the problem quite for quite a while. Maybe I shouldn't, but the, the thing is differentiation is the local property of a function. Yeah? You have a function, and you can locally look at the function to find the slope. And integration is the global property of the function. You have to look at all locations to calculate the integral. That's why integration is super hard, and differentiation is super easy. OK, okay so far, so good. Let's have now. Bayesian inference with hyperparameters and models, where the model prior is nothing else than a hyper hyper prior. Now here it's a yeah, it could be the hypothesis one, it's a support vector machine. Hypothesis two, it's a neural network. Hypothesis three, it's this and linear regression. So it could be different algorithms or different methods. It could be also different parameters, hyper hyper parameters. Okay? And nothing stops us from writing it down like this. Um, again, here I think I could omit the age as well for the same reason, right? However, um, typically we might have a curly age for this graphical model, and then we have another one with a completely different algorithm where we also have an hyperprior, but we are estimating some alpha from a support vector machine, and maybe whatever, some beta. And this is generating our data. So the graphical model for, I should w work on my age. So the um, 
Different hypotheses could also refer to d totally different constructions, how we generated the data. So it's not necessarily the same graphical model. Okay? That's why I included it. But it depends on your setup. Okay, you can guess what comes now. Here come all the expressions that you want to see, maybe. So here's the hyperposterior, and here's the hyper hyperposterior. Now, often called in this case the model posterior. Okay? So let's look at it. So here we are uh, getting our posterior information about the parameter. Here we integrate out the parameter and get posterior information about the hyperparameter. And here we integrate out the parameter and the hyperparameter and get information about our different hypotheses that we could then distinguish. Ideally, in a plot like that, yeah, we could have, maybe this was, oh, that is a nicer H. So this is hypothesis 1, hypothesis 2, and hypothesis 3. And maybe this support vector machine is super flexible, nonlinear, blah, 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 blah. So it's covering a lot of cases, and it has to spread its merits all over the place for all different data sets. And a more specific version, like a linear regression, yeah, much less sophisticated, but it's very good at some cases. Yeah? OK. So far, so good. And we can spell out all the formulas. So I just wrote them all down. Some of them get a special name. So this thing over here gets the name marginal likelihood. Okay, so what's marginal about it? We integrated out the parameter. So we integrated out the first level of parameters. That's it. So that's the marginal likelihood. And that is the one that often appears in textbooks and that is used also in the rest of the lecture. Here now I, I put a summation sign by saying, okay, I have discreetly many hypotheses, so discreetly many different models. But as I said, it doesn't have to be like that, okay? So also the hyper-hyper parameter could be a continuous variable. OK, so far so good. Um, question is, can we really, 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 really calculate all these integrals? OK, so this is my model specification. I have a prior on hypothesis. I have a prior condition on my hypothesis or my hyper-priors. And then I have a prior on my parameters, depending on my model assumption, and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm having some likelihood that tells me, under the current hypothesis and the current parameter, how is the data generated, how likely it is. And now if you write out the overarching evidence, P of the data, you get this horrible thing. So it's a summation of an integral of an integral of something. And this thing can't be calculated in, in closed form solution. Yeah? But if it could, we could do very nice model selection. Maybe it's already nice if we could just calculate this integral here. That would be already very useful, right? Then we could already do nice model selection. However, typically, the integrals get very nasty. By the way, that's a big deal with conjugate priors. Conjugate priors are chosen in such a way that you can do some of these calculations, at least. OK? Unfortunately not. We can't do this, right? But it's a general procedure, and if we could do integration, right, someone comes up with it, how to do integration, like formally, yeah, write down a Haskell program, call integrate on this Haskell program, and generate another Haskell program, which is calculating the integral, that would be awesome, yeah. So please solve this problem, yeah. I want to have it. Okay, now let's see. Is Bayesian model selection then just for slides, just for lectures, making nice plots? No, you can do something practical. But you shouldn't be too ambitious, OK? So let's show Bayesian model selection for regression, OK? First of all, instead of talking about P of the data, again, we are only modeling P of Y given X. So the formulas are slightly changing. Yeah, we have now the X included over here. Yeah, that's just slight change. What I wrote down was conceptually very general for Bayesian model selection in general. But this is now specific for linear regression. We can write out all these expressions as well. I mean, this is just copy and paste, where I now moved the d away and I put a y and an x in here. Now, what can we do with this? Um, let's look at level 1. OK, level 1 is fine. We can derive the posterior distribution for our w. Yeah? So that's something that we did. So we can calculate the posterior mean, which was that expression. 
And that is basically the rich regression expression, by the way. And we can also calculate the posterior covariance matrix. This just all follows from the lecture on the Gaussian distribution. Yeah, it's just some application of the tricks. Um, right now, by the way, I'm assuming the theta squared and the tau squared, which are the parameters of these Gaussian distributions, to be constant. Yeah, why is it important? Otherwise, I couldn't really concretely write code to calculate a w vector. I need numbers here. I need to plug in something. However, in model selection now, we would like to automatically infer sigma squared and tau squared. Okay, so let's do that now and say sigma squared and tau squared are now also random variables, and we want to do model selection, but combined with this posterior mean and posterior covariance stuff. Okay, let's write it out. So we have some hyperprior for our hyperparameters. We have a prior for our w, and we have our likelihood as before, but now we collect the, the, these hyperparameters into the vector theta, okay? And um, we, we can again infer the posterior distribution. That's just the one from the previous slide. Now explicitly writing out conditioned also on theta. And um, what we now get from level one is basically the evidence, which is the probability of seeing the data, yeah, of having our output values given a particular parameter set theta. And this thing is called the marginal likelihood. Yeah, that's the evidence of level one. Now, it would be nice if we could continue with that one and multiply the prior to it, the hyperprior, and then go on. However, this gets too complicated. This can't be done anymore. So typically, we stop at this point. So we are Bayesian on level one, and then we will be non-Bayesian on level two. Okay, and this is called empirical base. So what empirical base is doing, it's Bayesian about calculating the marginal likelihood. So the marginal likelihood really is integrating out my parameter against the posterior distribution, but then stop and say, this is like a likelihood for my parameter, hyperparameter theta, and now let's just do maximum likelihood for the hyperparameter. And that's like a compromise. So we are a bit Bayesian for the parameter level, and then we are maximum likelihood for the hyperparameter level. And this is different names. This is also called type 2 maximum likelihood, or as I said, empirical base, or it's called generalized maximum likelihood, sometimes also evidence approximation. So let's go through the math for linear regression, and I show you the marginal likelihood written out. And then we use matrix differential calculus to calculate the derivatives, OK? I hope you like it. So here's the marginal likelihood. It looks intimidating, but let's go through it step by step. Typically, these formulas only look intimidating because I add all the intermediate steps, OK? So the first step is just plugging in the expression for the marginal likelihood. It is the integral where I'm integrating out my parameter w. Next, let's plug it in. So that is a certain Gaussian distribution. That's my likelihood. And that is the Gaussian distribution that is the prior for my parameter. Next comes some magic step, OK? I'm using some of the superpowers from the Gaussian distribution lectures of shuffling around. If you have a product of two Gaussians, you can do some magic tricks. Yeah? And the magic trick here is to isolate the w which appears in the first Gaussian distribution, and it appears in the second distribution. And there's a formula to isolate it into a single Gaussian distribution, right? I talk in a second about the first term, but let's see what it buys us. It buys us now that the integration can be dragged into, or with other words, the first Gaussian distribution can be dragged out of the integral because it doesn't contain the w. And the last thing is just the integral of a Gaussian distribution, which is 1. So now, how is this step working? For that, I put all the details on this slide. So if you have something like a marginal Gaussian for x and a conditional Gaussian for y, yeah, then you can switch the roles of x and y and get somewhat magically transformed parameters. Okay, now this is a Gaussian distribution for y, where in the parameters there's no x. Okay, and this is a Gaussian distribution for x, where, of course, there is a y now, because x and y change the roles. OK, and the trick to go from here to here is just one of the formulas that I showed you before. 
but applied to this case. Okay, so nice so far. Um, let's look at this one. So the logarithm of our Gaussian distribution yeah, can now be evaluated to be this expression down here. And let me do this on the board, okay? I show you that this can be written down. So first of all, I need to wait for the boards. And let's write down a simple Gaussian distribution, a simple multivariate Gaussian distribution. Maybe with the wrong, wrong parameters here, but let's just, ah, let's make it, oh, we want to have it multivariate, okay? So ideally now I'm able to write it down, and if I'm not mistaken, it was something like 2 pi to n half, where n is the dimensionality of my x, okay? And times, um, I think, the square root of the covariance matrix. I think that's right. Yeah, the bars here are, it's like a norm, right? But it's calculating the determinant. Times e to the minus a half x minus mu transpose times sigma inverse times x minus mu. OK, so far so good. Let's put a logarithm in front of it and hope for the best. So as you know, the logarithm is turning products into um, additions. Yeah? And in particular, I can apply the logarithm to each of these different factors here. In particular, logarithm to the E function is particularly nice. It just destroys the E function, and I end up with this nice term. Okay? What's happening down here? So down there, I, for example, have um, the logarithm of 1 divided by 2 pi n half. OK, so let's just look at this expression isolated. That is the same as saying that is the logarithm of 2 pi to the power of minus n half, right? So the minus sign is like 1 divided. And then there's the formula logarithm of something to the power, I can drag out the power to the front of the logarithm. Right? This is a product, 2 pi times 2 pi times 2 pi, and I turn it into a sum. 2 pi plus 2 pi plus 2 pi plus 2 pi. So it's the same as dragging out this guy. So I get minus and half logarithm of 2 pi. OK? Nice. So let's write it down. Um, Similarly, I get the logarithm of 1 divided by z1, so it's the logarithm of the determinant of sigma to the power of minus a half, so I can drag out the minus a half and end up with the logarithm of the determinant of sigma. And then I have logarithm of the e function, which now just disappears. Okay, interesting. So why going through the pain and dealing with this stupid constant term Aren't we usually just submitting it, right? That's the whole point of doing logarithm. It's only constant if we are talking about the stuff up here. If we are optimizing over some x times w minus y, and then we're optimizing over the w over here, then the term in front here is constant. Now we are doing model selection. Model selection is about the hyperparameters. So the hyperparameters here are mu and sigma. So those are the interesting ones. So the first term is constant. OK, that is irrelevant. However, that term is relevant. OK, so here the sigma appears, and here the sigma and the mean appears. OK, so far so good. So let's see whether this is approximately what I promised. Yes, we have minus and half logarithm of 2 pi minus some complicated expression like that one. OK, so where does this come from? For this one, we need to go back one slide. Two slides? No, how many slides do I have to go back? Over here. So that is actually just the posterior variance. OK? So that is the posterior variance. Yeah? OK, so that's where this one is coming from. And similarly, over here. So that is the covariance matrix of the posterior distribution. No, of the, um, no, no, stop. This is the 
covariance not of the posterior distribution, but it's the posterior of the marginal likelihood. That's it, okay? So I, I was wrong. It's not coming from the previous, previous slides. It's coming from the magic going from the second line to the third line. That's where I'm getting this expression from, okay, from the marginal likelihood. So it's a covariance matrix of the marginal likelihood. That's where this expression is coming from. Okay, so it's a logarithm of the determinant of that one. Nice. And it also appears back here to the power of minus one. Now, this is a function in sigma squared and in tau squared. And those are the two parameters I want to optimize over now. Okay, how can I do this? By calculating the derivative. And can we do it with matrix differential calculus? Yes, we can. Okay, and I show you on the board how to do it. So now let's calculate the derivative of this thing here. Uh, I don't know what, let's give it a name. Phi of sigma squared and tau squared. Okay. And now let's apply matrix differential calculus to it to calculate the derivative. Uh, so the sigma here is, um, now let's put the sigma over here. Sigma was, uh, I don't know it by heart. Let me just copy it. It's sigma squared times the identity matrix plus tau squared times x times x transpose. OK, so now let's calculate the derivatives of these guys. So first of all, they both appear in the sigma. So what are the terms that can vary in here? That one can vary, and that one can vary. OK, so those are the interesting terms here. So let's say d phi, and then I can say d of the so whole expression, just plugging it in. The first term is constant. I can omit it. The next one is not constant. So I get a d minus a half logarithm of the determinant of sigma. OK? Minus d of the second part, OK? So I remove the constant part, and I put the d in front of the two summons. Let's drag out the minus sign. And what else can we drag out? We can drag out the 1 half. And then we have d log determinant of sigma. What about this one? It's constant. This thing is constant. That thing is constant. So it will be a half x minus mu. Is it right? Hopefully, yes. OK, here we just have the mean 0, OK? So the mean is 0. So let's um, omit it. So let's just, ah, OK, now let's do it not with mean 0. Let's do it like that, fine. And I have it in front of the d sigma to the minus 1. The minus 1 is still at the sigma. It's not separated from it times x minus mu. Great. Next, what we have to do, we have to look at our formula collection for d log determinant, OK? And for that one, I dearly, I have it here somewhere. Background, open, bn 142. And you see it's already an old document. I first started to work on that one in 2013. So let's look for the right formula. It's over here. So it's a d log dead. And I can replace it with a trace of the inverse d u. OK, let's do that. So where is my chalkboard? It's here. So it's 1 and a half. And then it comes trace from sigma inverse d sigma. I just plugged it in. What about inverse matrix? That's also a dangerous one. So let's find it. So where is it? Oh, it's over here next to it. It's minus the inverse of the matrix, d the matrix, then again the inverse of the matrix. By the way, that can be very easily proven by the product rule. Um, so let's do it. So it's minus a half x minus mu transpose. Then I get a sigma inverse, a d sigma, and a, another sigma inverse, 
x minus mu, and the d sigma is now nicely isolated. Question? What it means? Yeah. Oh, it's the stuff from matrix differential calculus last time. Did you check out already last time's lecture? No. Ah, OK. I think when you watch it, you will know it. If you haven't watched it, this is completely strange what I'm doing here. Yeah? This is a strange way of calculating derivatives. But I think when you watch a lecture and you don't know what this means, contact me. OK, good. So. Now what we need to do, we need to bring it to this form trace of a matrix times d sigma, right? How can we do it with this expression? The d sigma is inside, right? We want to get it out, but they don't commute matrices, right? What can we do? Let's look for scalars. So this thing is a scalar, right? It was e to a scalar. So I can put a trace in front of it, OK? So the trace of alpha is equal to alpha. Fine. So what does it buy me? So the trace of matrix A times B is equal to the trace of matrix B times A. That's somewhat surprising. However, this is calculating the inner product, uh, like so the row times the column dimension. And this is doing the column times the row dimension. So it's changing the rows. But if you write it out for the entries, by this, you are just commuting the inner, inner summation over here with the summation of the trace and the other way around. OK? I can do it, let's say, in 15 minutes. But to finish it today, maybe I don't prove that now. However, what does it tell me? It means under the trace, I can arbitrarily rotate matrices back and forth. So I can move these matrices just to the beginning. OK, so let's do that. So I have now trace of. Oh, by the way, I think there's a minus sign missing. So I got a minus sign from this formula over here. There's a minus sigma inverse. So let's shuffle around a little bit. I put the 1 half. Let's, first, let's put this to the end. I, put this, I first get a sigma to the minus 1. Then I have an x minus mu. Then I have an x minus mu transpose. So far, so good. Matrix times column vector times row vector. So the inner dimensions agree. This is a column vector. This is a row vector. It's like the outer product um, times sigma inverse. And then comes the d sigma. But let's first add this term, minus 1 half sigma inverse. So far, so good, times d sigma. OK? Now I got the, this is my derivative that I want. Almost, I'm after sigma and tau. However, you see already a trick when you do these derivations. Don't put all the terms in, right? If the, if the actually variables that you have are inside another term, first calculate the differential with respect to this guy, so until you have it here at the end. And next, I can plug in for this sigma. So let's go on. So it's a trace of some gigantic matrix B, let's call it like this, times d sigma. Let's now just plug it in. So it's d times sigma squared identity matrix plus tau squared times x, x transpose. OK, let's first deal with the case for the sigma squared. So the sigma squared is my variable. Everything else is constant. That basically means I can drag this, the d in front of the sigma squared. The identity I can drag out and multiply with my b. OK? So that will be the trace of b d sigma squared. And the term at the, at the end is gone. What about this tau squared one? So this is now again opening a bracket. That's basically the trace of b. This term is constant, so it disappears, and I need to jack out the x over here, OK? And then this is my derivative for sigma, and this is my derivative for the tau squared. I show you on the slide the nicely written out form. In particular, unfortunately, I, I put an x in here. 
So I should have put a why in here, right? Since we were talking about the why on the slides. So let's look at the slides again. So where are they? So we had a Gaussian distribution with a y over here. So it was slightly different. So this is the same calculation that I just did on the board. Nicely written up. OK. And then if I replace a dA in this case with the expression, I get the derivative with respect to sigma squared and with tau squared. OK. And those are just the expressions that we derived. I don't know whether you can derive them with partial derivatives. I think it's really tough yeah, to do this. It's no fun. Um, so now, great. Now we have the derivatives. We can run gradient descent and optimize over sigma squared and tau squared. OK? This is the end. But let's look at the code. There are some hurdles to take. But let's first stop here. Any questions about this calculation? Maybe not immediately. OK. Feel free to ask in the chat. Right? If there's something, some steps that you are blocked. Yeah? Because if you are blocked, there might be a mistake in my slides. And you know, yeah, those mistakes are important for everyone. OK, so let's look at Bayesian linear regression now. So the setup at the beginning is the same. I'm generating some toy data. OK? And my y is now a 100 dimensional vector. Fine, so far so good. Additionally, now I need a prior for my w, OK? And my prior has a certain variance tau. And um, that is just fixed in this case. Um, I can do this, sure. And I can calculate the posterior distribution. Yeah. So for the given choice of my parameters here, I can also have a different variance. Then I get slightly different covariance matrix down here. I get a posterior mean, which is the 2D array, and I get a, a matrix, a 2 by 2 matrix, which is a posterior covariance matrix. And I just use the formulas that we have written on the slide for the posterior distribution of the W. So it's just exactly that. OK? So this tau is, but it's something that is a hyperparameter, so I don't want to specify it. OK? So let's do type 2 maximum likelihood about it. By the way, a good thing about type 2 maximum likelihood is that we are not Bayesian anymore about this parameter, so I don't have to write down a prior distribution, right? I don't want to write down a prior distribution for this hyperprior. Of course, I should if I'm fully Bayesian, but here I'm only Bayesian for the parameter and not for the hyperparameter. Let's implement the log marginal likelihood, OK? And since I want to run gradient descent on it, I'm implementing the negative log, negative, uh, the negative log marginal likelihood. Right? I just take the sign. So this is the log marginal likelihood. This is exactly the expression that I derived. So it's like um, y times the inverse of a, is it somewhere here, times y. OK, so that is basically this expression, right? Since we are talking about y and y on these locations. yeah. Or you couldn't see it, so let me switch. So that is basically that, not that expression in the code. It's y times the covariance times y. The next term is minus a half logarithm of the determinant of the covariance matrix. And finally, for completeness, it's constant, so I could omit it. But let's include it. It's 1 half times n times the logarithm of 2 pi. OK? Great. And again, I'm using this trick of calling the function solve from NumPy to avoid the inversion of a matrix. Right? I don't need to invert the matrix. I just need to multiply a vector with my inverted matrix. And that can be done with solve. OK, so that is my negative log marginal likelihood. And I give it a short name where I directly plug in the data and the parameters. OK? So this is now a function only of the hyperparameters, which is useful, because then I can run gradient descent on it. OK, so far so good. Let's run this. Nice, works. And I can calculate it and plot it. OK, so let's plot it. So here now the x and y axis are some log space for sigma squared and tau squared. Up here, I choose a particular tau squared. But now I'm saying, no, I don't want to choose a tau squared. Tau squared is a hyperparameter. I want to infer it by using marginal likelihood maximization, uh, minimization. 
Ah, no, maximization, but negative log marginal likelihood minimization. So let's look at the plot and let's try to find the minimum. And it looks kind of, um, how can I turn this around? I, ah, okay, like this. So it's very flat, but there might be, so there's a hint of a dent going down. Okay, so that might not be the best way to plot it. Let's take a 2D plot. And before plotting it, add 10 and take the logarithm. So those are all monotonic functions, but they make it nicer visible where the minimum is. And then we see that somewhere down here, yeah, for a certain value of sigma and a certain value of tau, the marginal likelihood is maximized, okay? In this case, minimized. Um, these are the indices into some array, array, arrays, okay? So here are some arrays, sigma squared array and the tau squared array, which is using some log space, so to be like scale invariant. And those are the indices. If I look at the values, they are quite reasonable. Okay, my sigma square is 0 0.03. So that is a hyperparameter, but I can check how I generated the data. So how did I generate the data? Okay, I generated with 0 0.04. So it's matching very nicely. Okay. What about the tau squared? The tau squared is not appearing in how I generated the data because the tau squared is part of my model. Okay, so there is no true value really to it. Okay, and it turns out, um, whoops, what happened? It, it turns out that the, the best value is something like 8.8 .8 in my model, okay? So that is maximizing the marginal likelihood. Okay, let's calculate the gradient of this thing. We just did it on the board. So this is this big matrix expression that we just derived, yeah? So that was this sigma times y times y transpose times sigma minus sigma. And once I need to multiply it with the x times x transpose, and once I don't. So those are the gradients. But of course, you need to check it with finite differencing. And when you do this repeatedly, you see I always get the same value. So that's, for me, proof enough that the formulas are right. OK, great. Here's a small implementation of gradient descent. You might know it already from optimization. If, if you don't, you just go small steps downhill. That's what gradient descent is. Um, it takes a gradient and some function, and then it just does going downhill. This is a small test for the code, so it's nicely minimizing here some squared function. I'm not expecting that you understand every detail in the code now. However, it should be enough to get you started when you look at the implementation. And this kind of code now looks, it's not simple, so it took me like three days or something to implement it. So if you spend half an hour on it and you don't understand it, yeah, please spend another half an hour on it because it's, it's really tricky. But I, ideally, I made it very simple. So we can calculate it at these optimal positions that we found we, to just get a feeling. It's like minus 8. That's something that we also seen in the plot. And then we can run gradient descent. And there's an interesting subtlety here. I tried it many, many, many times, and it usually failed. But now it kind of works. So now, after many, many iterations, I'm correctly estimating the sigma squared, and I haven't put it in, and I have used all the data for the estimation of the parameter and of the hyperparameters, which is quite amazing. And I get some reasonable value for the tau squared. If you run it longer, the tau squared might also go to its true value. However, it's very, very badly scaled. So what I needed to get it to run is I needed two different learning rates. I needed one learning rate for sigma square and a different learning rate for, for tau square. So this thing is, in, from the optimization point of view, like very badly behaved. So it's, in principle, possible. You are a little bit Bayesian, and then you are empirical Bayesian for the hyperparameters. But at the end, it gets quite painful to optimize this for a super simple example. So you can imagine, for a larger example, it's, it's not so easy to do. But in principle, it can be done. OK, that's it for today. Thanks for your attention. And I see you on Monday.